Repair of a Tracheal Injury with ECMO Support by Shanda Blackman and Aaron Gillespie from Mayo Clinic, Rochester. We have no relevant disclosures. The objective of this video will be to review tracheal injuries, to review repair strategies, to review ECMO options, and review ventilation strategies. In April of 2016, a 48 year old woman with a psychiatric history, a history of Factor V Leiden disorder, a prior deep venous thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and inferior vena cava filter placement, prior gastric bypass surgery, and a history of hypothyroidism was intubated in the field after an acute ingestion. A bougie was utilized during the intubation. She was bradycardic and minimally responsive. The chest x-ray obtained immediately after she was admitted to the hospital shows that the endotracheal tube appears to be in correct position. The tip of the tube appears to be extending beyond the carina, but it is not clear that she has a pneumothorax or any subcutaneous air or any other acute problems. She was taken from a local emergency room to a bigger hospital in North Dakota where a new chest x-ray demonstrated subcutaneous air. The malposition of the endotracheal tube was questioned at that time and the patient began to have respiratory distress. A CAT scan was performed at the outside hospital. The CAT scan demonstrated that the tip of the endotracheal tube was present outside of the airway. The balloon of the endotracheal tube was located in the hole that was created in the membranous part of the airway. There was massive subcutaneous air making the patient have a habitus that was twice her normal presentation size. The air can be seen in the pericardium and within the mediastinum tracking all the way up to the neck. The massive subcutaneous air made it very difficult to visually inspect the patient. In contrast to the lung windows, the soft tissue windows clearly demonstrate the presence of the endotracheal tube. The endotracheal tube and the nasogastric tube can both be seen. The endotracheal tube is clearly seen to exit from the trachea, which is suspicious. The coronal, sagittal, and axial views of the tip of the endotracheal tube clearly show that the tube is exiting the membranous part of the posterior aspect of the trachea. The tip of the tube, seen in the top right, is located between the trachea and the esophagus. The esophagus appears to have some contrast within it, an indwelling nasogastric tube with fluid around it, but no clear extravasation. The aorta is seen just to the right side or the patient's left side of the trachea. The endotracheal tube is not seen to be penetrating any other adjacent structures. There is clearly air around the trachea where it should not be present. On the coronal view, one can see the endotracheal tube just distal to the cuff, present just below the carina. The cuff is clearly inflated and perhaps a bit overinflated, causing the membranous tear to enlarge. On the left side, one can see the posteriorly placed endotracheal tube that is exiting from the membranous part of the trachea and the balloon appears to be tearing and extending the membranous tear to a length of approximately seven centimeters. A video bronchoscopy was performed showing the posterior membranous tear. The right and left main stem bronchi can clearly be seen. The posterior membranous tear also can see ragged edges with a fluid filled mediastinum that already has purulent debris. The tip of the endotracheal tube clearly passed distal to the carina posteriorly, and that track is well established, making us feel as though perhaps the endotracheal tube was there for quite some time before it was discovered. It is possible that perhaps the patient stayed alive because the tear was so large and the ventilation of the mediastinum occurred because the tear was large enough to allow circulation into the lungs. Over 24 hours from her initial presentation, the patient was transferred to Mayo Clinic for evaluation and care. Immediately, she was taken to the operating room for airway stabilization. At that time, we performed an emergency tracheostomy with placement of a size 6 armored endotracheal tube into the left mainstem bronchus. We anchored this left-sided tube to the tracheal incision. 
The orally placed size 5 pediatric long endotracheal tube was placed into the right main stem bronchus and anchored to the molar with a suture through the gum, covering the right upper lobe orifice. The photographic diagram of the patient shows the orally placed size 5 endotracheal tube going in to the right main stem bronchus. You can see a left central venous catheter and a left main stem size 6 armored endotracheal tube going through a tracheostomy <clears throat> and ending in the left main stem bronchus. Tracheal stay sutures were used to secure the tube as well and reacquire access to the trachea in the event that the tube was inadvertently dislodged. Mediastinal drains were placed deep into the mediastinum to drain the purulent contamination of the mediastinum. We ultimately achieved bilateral main stem bronchial intubation with cuffs secured in the right and left main stem bronchi to allow separate lung ventilation, protecting each lung separately. Both of these endotracheal tubes could either be connected by a Y connector to a single ventilator or connected to different ventilators. Given the differences in diameter, the resistance to airway is obviously different, and therefore different ventilators could actually be employed to ventilate the separate lungs and calculate the compliance of the lungs and the mean airway pressure, peak airway pressure, and ventilatory modes. It is important to make sure that these catheters going into the airway are secure and that the endotracheal tubes are not dislodged or inadvertently moved. The most secure way to secure a tube through an oral route is to actually anchor it through the gum to a molar. By anchoring it to the face or the lips, which are quite mobile, could possibly result in inadvertent dislodgement. We felt that in this particular circumstance, the risk of traversing the gum with a needle far was less than the benefit of achieving a very stable endotracheal tube that would not pop out of the main stem airway and come back and cause the tear to propagate, nor would it distally migrate, causing us to lung, lose valuable lung to ventilate. It is also important to note that the endotracheal tube that was placed in the right main stem bronchus had a balloon cuff that was utilized to secure the airway. That balloon cuff covered the right upper lobe bronchus, as it is quite a short distance between the carina and the right upper lobe bronchus takeoff, and this was a necessary evil. We knew that we were collapsing the right upper lobe orifice and potentially not adequately ventilating it, but we also knew that we were ventilating the right middle lobe and the right lower lobe, as well as the left lung. This was a sacrifice we were willing to make. The diagram clearly shows the posterior membranous tear on the trachea that extended just below where the tracheostomy placed endotracheal tube began all the way down to the carina. The chest x-ray obtained one day after surgery clearly shows the continued presence of subcutaneous emphysema. However, the endotracheal tubes can be seen in proper placement into the main stem bronchi. The lungs are well inflated, there is no pneumothorax, and the pneumobediastinum is markedly decreased. A CAT scan was performed with bilateral main stem bronchial intubation. This main stem bronchial intubation can be seen best on the coronal view, where each endotracheal tube is seen with the positioning of the balloon cuff. As we described earlier, the cuff can clearly be seen to occlude the right upper lobe takeoff, thus causing some collapse and atelectasis of the right upper lobe. However, the remaining lungs appear well ventilated. There are multiple different repair options at this juncture. One would include a bifurcated stent. Another one would include a direct repair. When performing a direct repair, it is important to make sure that the patient is weaned from the ventilator as much as possible and would technically be extubated or extubatable at the completion of the surgery. A patient in acute respiratory distress or with acute pneumonia should not be taken back for repair because of expected postoperative intubation. The best chance the patient has to recover from a repair as once they have had a chance to recover their lungs and they've been prepared for an extubation and they are prepared for the surgery as well. ECMO is always a nice salvage when the intubation is not optimal. If the patient's surgery goes longer than expected, 
or the patient's lungs do not recover from the surgery as expected, ECMO is a vital salvage option that allows the surgeon to minimize the peak airway pressures, to minimize the airway pressure on the repair, and to offer the patient a bridge to extubation. Bilateral mainstem intubation is a good option for temporary relief, but certainly would not result in an acceptable long-term solution or a repair of the posterior membranous tear. Jet ventilation may allow a temporary ventilatory mode to take over for ventilation of parts of the lung during the repair, but obviously is not a long-term option either. Cross-table ventilation is another heavily utilized tool when tracheal surgery is performed, especially when repair on the trachea extending down onto the left main stem bronchus is necessary. Patients can be ventilated by an endotracheal tube connected to cross-table ventilation and inserted through the thoracotomy and placed by the surgeon. This cross-table ventilation is life-saving in certain surgeries. However, it is important to note that the FiO2 must be brought down tremendously at least below 35 to 40 percent prior to the use of any sparking energy source during surgery to avoid an airway fire. Once the patient was thought to be in a state where she could be extubated had she not had the membranous tear, we then took her for repair. In the operating room, she underwent an operative repair of the tracheal laceration that was ultimately measured to be seven centimeters in length. We harvested the third and fourth intercostal muscles as a flap to buttress the repair upon entry into the chest. We harvested pedicled latissimus muscle flaps as well. We removed the fourth rib for improved exposure and to facilitate the harvesting of the third and fourth intercostal muscle flaps. We performed a posterior tracheal repair with a muscle buttress, and once we entered into the chest, we discovered that we could not simply repair the membranous trachea, as most of it had dissolved in the purulent debris within the mediastinum that was somewhat auto-digested. And therefore, we were forced to repair the posterior membranous tracheal repair with the muscle used to recreate the membranous part of the airway. The pleural surface was the new membranous surface of the airway. We noticed that she failed to wean from the ventilator after the repair, and that was when we employed the ECMO as assistance to wean from surgery. A right posterolateral thoracotomy approach was utilized during her surgery. The operation began with dissection of a latissimus muscle flap. Using bovie electrocautery, we were able to dissect out the entire latissimus muscle, keeping it based off of a superior anterior pedicle. The vascular blood supply to the latissimus muscle is clearly pointed out with the instrument. We then performed an intercostal muscle flap harvest. This intercostal muscle flap harvest was utilized to create the new membranous part of the trachea. We carefully used a Madsen periosteal rib elevator to separate the nerve artery and vein from the undersurface of the inside of the rib using a scraping maneuver. We then used bovie electrocautery to truncate the muscle. A right-sided exposure provided excellent exposure to the posterior aspect of the airway. As you can see in the repair, the intercostal muscle flaps were used in tandem to replace the membranous part of the trachea. The interrupted sutures that were used to pexy the intercostal muscle flap and make up for the very large defect effectively filled that entire space that was previously occupied by a membranous trachea. The interrupted sutures allowed us to do this meticulously and easily with good exposure. By placing a camera inside the chest, even though we had an open thoracotomy, we were able to demonstrate this technique. The actual repair was performed over an endotracheal tube, ensuring that we were not narrowing the trachea too much. In the operation, we performed access to the mediastinum through the right thoracotomy, dissecting out first the azagous vein. We used an endostapler with a gray load to divide the azagous vein as anterior as possible, hopefully utilizing the vein itself to buttress anything 
or hold anything in place covering it later on. We then entered the mediastinum and began to dissect out the trachea. The trachea can clearly be seen with the top of the screen representing the head and the bottom of the screen representing the feet. We dissected out the posterior membranous portion of the trachea and encountered dense adhesions, purulent material that was cultured, and fibrinous debris. Once the tracheal laceration was easily identified, we used a series of 4 oiled vicral sutures to create a membranous trachea by buttressing an interrupted layer of the 4 vicral being sutured to the intercostal muscle flap. We knew that a single intercostal muscle flap would not be long enough to create the repair, and therefore, after we sutured the patient's left side of the trachea to the left side of the intercostal muscle flap, the patient's right side of the tracheal injury to the right side of the intercostal muscle flap, we then had to bring in the second intercostal muscle flap to complete the repair at the level of the carina. The azagous vein can easily be seen interposed in between the two intercostal muscle flaps. The intercostal muscle that was used to repair the membranous part of the trachea was cut back before it was sutured into place to a dopplerable good signal to ensure that we had healthy muscle repairing the trachea and that we would not have muscle necrosis after it was utilized for repair. We then tested the repair underwater after bringing the cuff down. The retractor on the lung is holding back the ventilated lung, but you can see the remaining portion of the lung is coming up as evidence that air is traversing through the trachea. No air bubbles were detected. At the completion of the surgery, the patient failed to wean from the ventilator as her sedation was lightened, we found that her respiratory effort was too weak. We also found that she could not pull enough tidal volume to effectively wean from the ventilator. Therefore, we did employ the use of ECMO. A size 23 cannula was inserted into the right internal jugular vein. A smaller cannula was selected because of the patient's very small vein that was visualized and measured by ultrasound. An Avalon cannula was used, and this was inserted over a guide wire that can be seen on the far left screen picture. We then placed the cannula with the dilator over the guide wire using the Seldinger technique much as we would for a central line. And then after the cannula was placed, the guide wire was removed. In the photograph, you can clearly see we are attempting to ventilate the patient, the tracheal intubation was remaining, the oral intubation had been removed, the mediastinal drains are remaining, and the Avalon cannula is in the right internal jugular vein. The patient is seen breathing spontaneously for her right lung with the tracheal CPAP ventilatory mode for the left lung, the ECMO cannula in the right internal jugular vein going into the heart, a thoracic drain placed from the thoracotomy, and the size 6 armored tube going into the left main stem bronchus. During the removal of the clot, we were able to visualize the intercostal muscle flap as it had been used to buttress the posterior membranous part of the airway. The flap was actually replacing the membranous part of the airway in this picture, and you can see the junction looks as though there is some purulent debris. At that time, we were concerned that there was partial dehiscence of the intercostal muscle flap, although we could not clearly demonstrate a leak. However, later on we discovered that there was no obvious dehiscence, nor was there an obvious air leak, and the patient continued to recover. On postoperative day 15, a repeat bronchoscopy revealed a healing intercostal muscle flap. Virtually the entire posterior membranous part of the airway is replaced by this intercostal muscle flap, which is now healing and becoming incorporated into the part of the airway such that it is barely distinguishable. When the patient returned, more than a month after surgery, an endotracheal visualization with bronchoscopy showed that the tracheal repair had healed. Although the airway may be perhaps a bit narrowed, there was good healing with the interposition of the intercostal muscle flap, and there was some retraction of the muscle. However, the airway was healthy, the patient was breathing with no difficulties,
and had a nice recovery. The one-month CT scan performed after her repair shows a very well-healed airway that appears to be normal. The intercostal muscle flap can be seen buttressing the posterior membranous part of the airway, and the latissimus muscle can be seen as it swings into the chest through the window and buttresses the intercostal muscle repair. The lungs were well inflated. There was no evidence of pneumonia. The trachea appeared virtually normal from the inside. The patient is now followed up three months after repair and continues to do well. Thank you for your attention and the opportunity to present this patient to you.